This is Jay Makani, and um, well, he is head of the um, Hindu Academy, which is a, uh, a body that um, uh, make GCSE for Hinduism and uh, well, generally um, get, get the reach out wider. He's uh, also on the uh, board of directors for the Hindu Council UK, and uh, these days he gives a lot of talks on um, uh, spiritual humanism, and the uh, talk today is on uh, science and spirituality, so if we can give him a round of applause. Yes, good evening, friends. <clears throat> you see, if we have any system where the different parts of the system do not sit well with each other, a system will be disjointed, it can cause confusion, it can create friction. And this is the society that we live in. In a way, this is because of, if like, a sad legacy of Wittgenstein's teaching, which suggested that it is possible to have some, you know, variety of different self-consistent systems with their own truth claims, which can coexist with each other, and perhaps you don't need to reconcile. Now, you see, this may have been okay, with, but I don't think Wittgenstein meant this to be, you know, acceptable. It should be possible to reconcile variety of different systems at a deeper level. And the disjoint <coughs> that we face at the moment is as follows. You see, the greatest disjoint we have in modern society, and this is my experience, I go to lots of sixth form seminars and do teachings and so on in philosophy, and I ask the youngsters, um, first question I ask is, how many atheists, how many agnostics, how many truly believers in the religion? Now, at the, up to the age of about 15, majority will put their hands up because they mistakenly think that belonging to a tradition means they believe in that, that's their religion, so they take their names. But the age of 16 to 18, they start to move away. And vast majority, when I say vast majority, sometimes 90% of the youngsters, 16 to 18 age, year, age, age, year, age group, now call themselves either atheist or agnostic. This is reality. So the youth are showing their displeasure of religion or the status quo of religion by moving away from their religion in droves doesn't matter whether you're Hindu or a Christian or whatever. They are moving away from the religion. This is the biggest disjoint that we face. A disjoint which is kind of in a way of saying that there is a multitude of religious worldviews. They can, we can put them on one side. And there is this, if you like, a more science-oriented, rationally founded, popularly called secular worldview on the other side. And it is time for <coughs> us to recognize that majority of youngsters now fall into the second category. This produces the biggest disjoint regarding a spiritual and a secular worldview. Now, you see, unless you address the issue, as I said, wherever you've got any system where different parts don't sit well together, it is going to create confusion, conflict, and problems. And this is what we face. If you open the newspaper, you see straight away the two issues that continue to kind of appear in the newspaper is Strife in the name of religion means even the different religious worldviews can't sit well together with each other, trying to, point, uh, to score points on each other. So you can see if you like a disjoint kind of dictating society and interfering with the working of the society. So it is crucial for thinkers to try and address this demarcation between a secular and a spiritual worldview. And this is what I wish to do in the next 40 minutes. And after that, of course, I'm open to questions, and they can be challenging and pointed questions, and I'm quite open to that. I'm used to that. So first of all, let me begin the journey by looking at the religious angle. Now, what I'm presenting, you may find quite unusual, because this is not standard rhetoric you get from people from, of people of religion. And this is what I'm suggesting. Despite appearances, normally religions are, tr are considered to be, if you like, nothing more than a belief system. It's purely hypothesis, really. We have to live on the hypothesis. This is the standard view of religions, that belief is the central word. And science-oriented worldview says experience, if you like, empirical evidence is our foundation. So it seems to be a disjoint. But really, when you look at the religious enterprise, and if you really quiz the theologians or the philosophers of any religion, and really quiz them hard, and say, how can you be sure about your enterprise? How can you be sure about this God chap? Vast majority of them you see, I'm just exploring this idea of how do you address the demarcation between, if you like, a popularly called secular worldview, which is science-oriented, rationally founded, 
and a multitude, not just but multitude of religious worldviews. How can you possibly remove this demarcation or find a reconciliation? Because unless you find a reconciliation, this division or this divisive system is going to create friction in society. And this century and this decade, this issue has to be resolved. Because at the moment, science is winning in a major way. And in fact, almost telling people of religion, we're going to snuff you out. You had the problem and not the resolution of the human condition. We'd rather snuff you out. This is reality. A majority of youth I come across, you know, especially in sixth forms, etc., are telling me very clearly, sometimes 90%, they'd rather be an atheist or an agnostic than a person subscribing to a religious point of view. And then we've got multitude of religious worldviews, so they can straightway challenge us saying that, look, you guys first sort yourself out. You've got different religions. Some religions have one god, some have many, some have no god like Buddhism. So why don't you first sort yourselves out, guys? You can't, all of you can't be right. So sort yourselves out first. Play one religion against another. Straight away comes as a challenge. This can't be right. So I'm going to begin my journey by looking at examining the deeper aspects to religion. And I might make many of you shudder because I'm going to look at the deeper aspects of religion. And this might involve jettisoning some of the ploys used by religion around which religions are woven. And I might jettison them. And so it might make you feel a bit rattled. But so be it. If you are really trying to address this issue of removing the demarcation, you may have to jettison some of the ploys that have been parading in the name of religion, and you may also have to jettison some stuff that appears in the name of science. Now you say, I can talk about science because my background is science, and I have tremendous love for the integrity of science. So I'm not here to undermine science, and I'm not here to undermine religions either, and yet you see how I'm trying to address this issue of reconciling this variety of different worldviews. Let's begin with the religions. When you really quiz the people of religion saying, how can you be sure? I mean, they'll give you all sorts of cosmological argument and teleological argument and argument based on miracles and scriptures, you know, revelation. All this will fall by the wayside. You can, you can you know, easily show the weaknesses of all these particular aspects. It doesn't prove. When you really push, that, push them hard, push them in the corner until the people begin to squeak, a theologian will say, well, I don't know, but this man said so, and he'll point at somebody a prophet of that religion, or a sage, or a seer of that religion. So he said so, and I'm just prepared to go along with him, because his life is so exciting and so interesting, I'm prepared to go along with the enterprise, because he said so. Now, when you look at this person, or this prophet of every world religion, see, something happened to them, and this was very experiential. This was not a belief. They did not suddenly discover a belief system, or intellectualize, had cups of coffee, and walked it out. They actually had an encounter of the first kind, if I can use the language which seem to have changed their lives for the better, and seems to change the life of anybody who goes near them. And yet they are talking different languages. So how can you have so many religions? What's going on? Let me give you a Hindu input in this. This is pure esoteric Hinduism. This is not standard Hinduism. This is what I'm suggesting. Look, you to agree with me, I'm, making, I'm very clear about my language. I'm suggesting, I am saying, at the experiential level, Every prophet, every sage, every seer of any religion, every religion hit the same jackpot. They had the same experience. And they were struggling to give expression to this experience because they said this experience is beyond words. It is an ah thing. We can't put it in words. So they've all been complaining, saying it's transcendent. That's the language they use, transcendent. We don't have words to describe our experience. And yet that is the foundation of all of our, all of our, our activities, our belief system. We had a fantastic transcendent experience and we can't put it in words. And what do they do, do next? They do exactly that. They try and put it in words. So after this experience, they open their mouths and try and interact with the greater society to try and present this idea of this, if like this very highly personal experience. So they will open their mouths and give expression to this experience. So far, so good. Now, Every time they open their mouths to give expression, what tools they have? Of course, the language they are using, the mindset in which they operate, and the mindset of the society in which they are operating. It cannot be otherwise. They will always use the language, the mindset of their, their own mindset, as well as the mindset of the, the people they are interacting. They are very keen to infuse what they have experienced into greater society, so they will use the only tool they have, this commun if you like this common thing that we possess <coughs> called language to give expression to their experience. So what I'm suggesting, I said I'll make you some of you shudder as, as we go along. 
that when Christ goes into the wilderness and comes back and tries to give expression to what is experienced, suppose he said, I had this transcendent experience, you know, with beyond words, the people say, well, go away then, don't waste our time. He has to use the language the people can understand because he's, you see, he's in love with humanity. He has seen the greater unity which links him with the rest of humanity. So he's prepared, he's going to go out of his way to use any tool at his, at his, at his you know, mercy and make sure this idea of spirit is fused, infused in the society in which he interacts. So they will open and say, ah, you see, I've seen the Father in heaven. And people say, yeah, that makes sense. We have fathers and fathers are nice and benevolent and look over our shoulder and guide us and look after us. And this heaven spirit, see, he will use that language. When Buddha goes and sits under the Bodhi tree and comes out an enlightened person, I'm suggesting same experience, given different expression. He does not refer to a theos. There's no God. He doesn't mention a God at all. He said, I feel enlightened. The way to resolve the human condition is for all of us, whole of humanity, to feel enlightened, to recognize what is the nature of reality. And that's the way you, tr you, you kind of you know, become spiritual. So again, you see, I'm saying the same experience given different expression, producing, if you like, variation of different religious movements. So far, so good still. You see, I'm just showing you a variation. I'm trying to find a reconciliation between multitude, multitude of religious worldviews. I'm just suggesting, just play along with me for the time. Maybe you can then ten tear me up. So I'm saying the same experience, when given expression, turns into different religions. Still is so far okay. Then the theologians move in. <coughs> because they have realized that their prophet is talking something that's very delicate. This is a fledgling plant. It can do great benefit. It can be very beneficial for the society. They are well-meaning people. So the church fathers and all the various theologians, various religions get together together and try and protect this fledgling plant by putting in lots of sets of doctrines and dogmas to protect the little fledgling plant. The intentions are good. But the moment you put up a barrier to protect something, it becomes divisive. It starts dividing humanity, those who are inside and those who are outside. These will go to heaven, these will go to hell. We start producing a divisive system. So when, forget about giving expression which is going to be very, you know, variable, once you try and interpret it, or give it, if you like, this kind of expression through doctrines and dogma, then it becomes downright divisive. That is why we have conflict in the name of religion. Because they are all trying to, you know, somehow score points against each other. And this becomes a divisive system. It was not intended to be, it was a well-meaning idea, and yet it turns into a divisive system. Now you see, the greatest thinkers like Russell, etc., Hume, etc., I have criticized world religions for this reason. They say, the reason why religions become counterproductive for the greater society is because of monotheism. This idea that we have conjured up of a, if you like, this great super personality is overlooking, uh, overlooking, our, sho overlooking over our shoulder and guiding us, etc., has become, if you like, seriously counterproductive. It creates fanatic behavior in society. Monotheism they pointed the finger at. And there is a reason why it is true. I mean, you see in present day, if you open the newspaper, this is the first thing that hit you. It is monotheism that creates this tremendous division in society, chaos and problem. Why does monotheism arise in the first place? Let us explore that. And what <coughs> I am now leading to now, esoteric Hinduism, moving away from theistic Hinduism into non-theistic Hinduism. Let me take you on the journey. This is what I'm suggesting. Essentially, we you know this idea of the spirit as something that you have an encounter of, you know, this, this, this first encounter of the spirit, or the idea that you see some, a deeper nature of reality, is more marvelous. What is it actually? Esoteric Hinduism says, this is not something that's external to you. In a way, this is in a way reflecting your own inner dimension, <coughs> your own spiritual dimension. What you were searching for in the name of God in the highest heaven as an invisible being in an invisible plane is your essential nature. So you say, well, I didn't know that. You see, the aspect that kind of become revealed in every living thing and becomes more clearly visible in human beings, what are these aspects? Just let's classify them. We seem to have, if you like, an endearing aspect to all of us 
it makes us compassionate, but it's very, not very perhaps grandly compassionate, but little compassionate. We like the people around us, perhaps our friends and our family members, and this seems to be trickling through. We are also inquisitive by nature and we are searching for knowledge. We seem to have natural affinity to acquire knowledge and be knowledgeable. Third thing, this is a unique feature about every living thing, whereas the biologists can learn from here. That when you try and define a living thing, what's the speciality of a living thing? So all, these, all the various ploys you use in your biology lessons, defining a living thing, will actually fall short. And it's a very tricky thing to define a living thing. Esoteric Hinduism says the way you define a living thing from a non-living thing is this. The thing that is living is always in defiance of natural forces and physical forces. It's never not in compliance. It always stands up against it, hates it. So if you try and prod it, it will say no. It will stand up against you. It won't roll over and play dead. This is the idea of a living thing. It does not comply with physical forces. It's in defiance of it. This is the way the Hindus define a living thing. It's very interesting. So what I'm saying is the, the living thing is that which does not like being buffeted, being pushed about. In fact, I did a kind of funny quip at Warwick University. I said, you see, how do you distinguish a living thing? I said, suppose you're walking and you see a piece of rock and you are in the mood to play rugby and you want to practice. So you might decide to give a kick to this piece of rock and being a physicist, of course, you can work out its trajectory to the nearest millimeter. You're very good at that. Suppose you see a dog. Now, you see, I'm a mild-mannered Hindu, not advocating violence against animals. Suppose you see a dog and you suddenly feel that, come on, let's go for it. And suppose you try to, you know, test your, you know, rugby skills. One thing you can be certain is you will not be able to work out the trajectory of the dog very likely it will go for your leg. <laughs> this is the difference. I'm lightening up a very serious issue. If you look at Fitzroy Capra, he defines living thing as that which is always in a way fighting against natural forces. It's always standing up against natural forces. And this is the right way. He said, if you disturb a living thing, you see, at best you can, you know, kind of, you can't prod it, but you can disturb it. It will go, ouch. Simple way of defining a living thing. It doesn't like to be pushed about. To become empowered is a unique feature about living things. You see, the reason why we are not sitting naked, huddled up in a chaos, hungry and thirsty and shivering at the mercy of the forces of nature, <coughs> but you put these forces of nature in wires, lit up this place, and sitting comfortably here, shows, if you like, the culmination of this process of becoming empowered. We don't like to be buffeted by forces of nature. We harness them, put them in wires, and then sit on top of them. This is a living thing, becoming empowered. So I'm just looking at the endearing aspect of all human beings. I'm telling you, this is, if you like, the spiritual underpinning revealing itself to us, our own spiritual underpinning. What is it? Compassion, search for knowledge, becoming empowered. Ah, unknowingly, we are in a way reflecting our underpinning, which is spiritual too, as I said, this is esoteric Hinduism. You are essentially that what you were searching for in the heaven. And it is revealing itself through these things. So what does monotheism do? It does a marvelous trick. It exaggerates these features, these human features, compassion, knowledge, empowerment, exaggerates it to infinite and plonks it onto one chap called God. And then says, okay, now for me to be religious, I must reflect these qualities. So if I'm little compassionate, oh, oh, that's not good enough. I must be more compassionate so that God will be happy with me. I can get closer to my, this infinite super person that I've just created. So we create an exaggerated human being with the endearing aspect of human qualities, not all aspects of humanity. In fact, in the ancient scriptures, in the Hebrew scriptures, as well as the Hindu scriptures, the God was sometimes violent and vicious and vindictive. They were exaggerating the human features, on, on, uh, the baser human features as well. But then we become more sophisticated. So, no, 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 not that part, the good part. <coughs> Compassion and power and knowledge. Exaggerate to infinite, plonk it on that fellow saying, God, you are all that. And by doing this, what is my benefit? In order for me to build relationship with him, I must reflect these qualities in my life. And that's called religious living. See? 
This is how religions have survived for a few thousand years. They, you see, the Hindus say, God has not created us in his image. We create God in our image. God we just created is an exaggerated human with good qualities, only good qualities. And then how does it fall flat? The moment you have a tsunami, the whole thing collapses. You say, you know, Jeremy Wine asked me on Radio 2 program, Mr. Lakani, what was your God doing when the tsunami struck? Was he having a siesta? These poor people have done nothing wrong. Why do you kill millions, hundreds of thousands? Why? No, where do you get answer? Now you see, the thing is this. Is we have created this super personality, this exaggerated human, and now we say, why, what were you doing? And the answer comes from that super personality saying, look, you created me like this. you sorted it out. I'm just showing you. This is a ploy, a human ploy, an anthropologic ploy <coughs> in order to, for us to reveal our spiritual dimension to a greater extent. We create this super, if you like, this exaggerated human with good qualities and try and build relationship with him. It works to a certain extent. Look, it's a ploy, but it works. People who are devout, say Christian or Hindu, they love this idea of blinking up the super personality and building relationship with him through worship and devotion and prayer. Let them, it's their business. But I am telling you, this is esoteric Hinduism telling you, this is a ploy. Once you recognize it as a ploy, then you can transcend it. Then you can go beyond it. Because you know what you've done. You used it in a very successful manner. And as long as it works, makes you more, more compassionate and more knowledgeable and more empowered, so be it. Provided you know its limitation. You see, the problem with humanity is this. It discovers many things. Sometimes it knows its scope but does not know its limitation. In fact, the contribution of Wittgenstein in this field, in fact, Hindus have been thinking about it for a long time as well, is this. You see, I just give you an example of one of the most powerful tools we all human beings possess and this particular thing we are going to touch on as we talk about science in a minute. You see, one of the most powerful tools we have discovered and this which, which has made us human from animal is this tool of language. Now, most people think language, you know, how do you, what, how do you classify, what is language? This is the way of communicating information with other human beings. So it makes sense, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it is. I mean, the stone-haired men would grunt, hoo, 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 water there, hoo, 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 buffalo, hoo, 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 woman. And you say, yeah, yeah, we understand, that's how it started. They're communicating with each other. But you know the deeper idea of language is not only the tool with which we communicate with other human beings, it is the tool with which we communicate with ourselves. Try and think of anything without a string of words appearing. Without it, you can't. So the words and language are not merely a tool to communicate with others. It's a way of communicating with yourself. To understand the nature of reality, we need this string of words. In fact, the more elaborate your language, the more elaborate your vocabulary, the more, you know, the vaster, the bigger your vocabulary, the more subtle grasp you can have of reality. This is, this is how humanity progresses. So the scope of your language in a way, you know, dictates your, your ability to relate to reality. And you may think, we are, we are studying physics here, why is it bringing language in it? You use it, you know that all of you use it, we use it. You know when you get all these scribbles of this psi square and x square and chi square and pi square? <laughs> this is nothing but <coughs> highly elaborate language suited to the needs of science. It's a language. All these scribbles are a way of doing mental gymnastics which you could not have done without all this symbolism and all these strings. That's why all your blackboards are covered up with all this chalk and all these, your professors are covered in chalk. They're using the language of science, language. But we sometimes forget to recognize and acknowledge that it doesn't only have a scope, it is limitation. And this is what we'll touch on when I talk about the second part about the ploy of science in a minute. But I'm still attacking the ploy of religion. This idea of monotheism. We need to move away from it. Look, the moment you tell a serious person of any religion that despite this ploy being very useful, there is no one super personality <coughs> sitting there in contrast to another super personality sitting in another religion. These are both ploys. That's why there are many different cultures, different societies have created different ploys. That doesn't mean there are many gods. There are many ways to relate to spirituality. 
And that is once you recognize it, then what appeared as, a, as an issue between religions fighting in the name of religion disappears immediately. This idea is promoted in Hindu religion as religious pluralism. Not many gods, not many religions, <coughs> many ways to relate to the idea of the spirit, something deeper about our essential nature. And this is, if you like, the best prescription to bring about reconciliation between a variety of different religious worldviews so that people don't fight in the name of religion. Look, I'll give you a very simple example I use in primary schools. You see how powerful this idea is, pluralism. Because first you need to reconcile a multitude of religious worldviews before you take on the challenge of science and rationality. I use this example in many schools, perhaps you will like it. There are two boys, best of friends, playing football. While they are playing, they start talking. One says, you know, my mom is the best in the world. Standard stuff for any boy to claim, even the grown-up boys, I'm sure. They say, your mom is the best mom in the world. Rubbish. My mom is the best mom in the world. She cooks the best food. Something primitive of boys, mommy and food. Mommy, your mommy cooks the best food. Those homemade cakes you brought last week, they were like rocks, rocks. Your mommy is rubbish. You tell any boy of any age is mommy and his cooking, her cooking is rubbish. This is the beginning of World War III. <laughs> and boys being boys, they like to resolve differences in physics. You see, all boys mostly, I know. They like to resolve differences physically. So they roll up their sleeves and I told you my mom is in there thumping and whacking. They both love their mommies. A wise man passing, what's your problem? I told him my mommies. Okay, calm down both of you. Let me give you a resolution, says the wise man. Say with all the love and devotion you can muster, don't hold anything back. My mom is best, but add two magic words at the end of your sentence. But say, what magic words? Say with all the love and devotion, my mom is best for me. The boy said, that's exactly what we meant. My mommy doesn't know this fellow exists even. Ah, see in two ticks, they become best of friends and start playing football. Such an easy prescription to resolve a serious conflict. Now this is what I've been telling people of religion. And I do this at, tech, at theological colleges all over the country. I say, assert with all the love and devotion you've got, my religion is best. But don't forget to add those two magic words for me and my congregation, not necessarily for the rest of humanity. Don't impose your mommy on others. They've got their own mommies. Leave them alone. This is pluralism. See the power of pluralism. This, the reason why I can talk like this is because of this idea <coughs> that I'm suggesting, right? I'm suggesting, I, don't, I can't say, oh, I know it. That essentially, the experience of all these prophets is same. Expression is different, interpretation is even more different, becomes divisive. And this, this, this creation of a monotheist God has become a ploy, and yet it becomes very seriously counterproductive for modern society, modern science. It flies in the face of science. The moment you create a, this you know, exaggerated human being and say, okay, he created the universe, you get all the scientists rolling the stairs and say, come here, what is his address, where does he live? This, this no, you are in trouble in two ticks, they'll tear you apart, I don't blame them one bit. Because you created a huge human being now, and you say, where is he now? He says, you don't know where he is, he's everywhere. Then you say, he's still human. It's just fluff, basically, <laughs> so it doesn't work. See, this necessary requirement to jettison the most central feature about many religions, including the Hindu religion, of course, of monotheism. You see, unless you jettison this, you recognize it as a plow, as crutches used by humanity to relate to its spiritual dimension, you are safe. But you tell a modern you, there is a person called God sitting in heaven watching over your shoulder and saying, you, I know you, you, you hit your sister when nobody's watching, I'm keeping record here. You come here, I'll sort you out. They say, I'd rather, you, I'd rather let you go. You can't get your youngsters this way anymore. It's gone. Those days, the cell by date of this approach is gone. Because we have grown up, we evolved. And as we like to say, we agree with Darwin. Unless you evolve, you die. When society continues to move and you, don't you are not prepared to evolve with the requirement of society, then your enterprise will die. And that's what's happening. Religions are dying on their feet because they are not prepared to recognize, if you like, this limitation of the ploy they were using. They want to insist this is literally true. Then you are in trouble. Because, 100 because God comes with a lot of baggage. Normally it's auntie from Manchester who comes with baggage. This one, God comes with much, much more baggage. It brings in so many unanswered questions. The moment you produce this super personality, you are in trouble. Because it is your creation. 
and you just kind of selectively created him to suit your requirement. That's why he can't answer your philosophic challenges. This is the first part of the presentation. <coughs> so where does esoteric Hinduism come in? He says, even this ploy of, of this search for, if you like, this compassion and knowledge and empowerment appear like rudimentary aspects of your spiritual dimension. There's a deeper dimension to your religion, to your, to your being. So what is the deeper dimension? I'm going to introduce two or three words now and then put them on the sideline and then talk about science and then bring them back in. You see why it's necessary. The Hindus say, even this idea of compassion, empowerment, in a way are reflecting very much human, if you like, issues and human, plo human kind of characteristics being exaggerated and being focused on. Look, a piece of rock is, exist, does exist as well. It doesn't understand what you mean by compassion and empowerment and all that. And yet it exists. So you need to dig deeper regarding what you mean is the spiritual dimension to this reality. And the three words the Hindus have discovered they are very endearing to me because you can see this is going to be the bridge between a secular and a spiritual worldview. The three words the Hindus use to define the spiritual underpinning of our being as well as this creation are asti, bhati, priya. This means existence is the underpinning to this reality. Consciousness is the underpinning to this reality and bliss is underpinning to this reality. And they are not three separate things. They are the one and the same thing, except that when you view it in different ways, they appear to have different names and different labels. Existence is underpinning to this reality. That is, if you like, the substratum on which everything, whether it's a piece of rock or a human or a living or a non-living thing, you know, come, come into, into being. Existence is underpinning. I want you to hold these three words, or these two words, especially asti and bhati in mind, while I take the challenge into the science lobby. As I said, I need to jettison some of the central features of science before we can find a reconciliation at a deeper level. Because I don't agree that you can just allow two systems to coexist with their own truth claims and say, oh, there is no reconciliation, this is, we live in a schizophrenic world. It won't work now. That's what's been happening until now. That's why when these students are about 14 or 15 and they're doing GCSC or whatever, when they go to the science or their, or, their, or their science lesson, they say, challenge everything. Every hypothesis must be tested to destruction. Then we move forward. That's how science progresses. Challenge everything. Don't accept anything. It must be empirical. It must be experiential. Otherwise, don't accept. And then he moves into the religious class and says, listen, my boy, it's all a matter of belief. Just believe and die and things will be sorted out. You don't want to do that. See? Straight away. Now until the age of 14 he's prepared to do this, live in this schizophrenic world. At 16 hopefully the thinking faculty has kicked in. And he recognized this can't be, go this can't be right. And he begins to challenge religions. It's understandable. It's a good sign that means he's alive. He's able to now move away from the idea of just signing up to a tradition and challenging it and thinking about it for himself. Now you see the reconciliation is very interesting. <coughs> you see, I must tell you what, what is my background so you get an idea of where I come from and why I find this a very thrilling subject to explore. And I do this at many colleges. The last session we did at Imperial College, we had John Polking on from the Christian tradition and a quantum physicist. I was the Hindu person with background in quantum physics as well. You see, I did my master's, my master's with Roger Penrose, but he was in London at that time. So my background is physics. I know my stuff reasonably well. Not perhaps as much as you perhaps know, because my stuff is antiquated. But I know it reasonably well to be able to take on and try and understand. Now when you look at science, you may think science is doing so hunky-dory. Everything is going very well for science. Things are working out so well. The reason how do you, why do you know that? Because every day you get up, you open your television screen or newspaper, a new gizmo is sold to you. This is the new iPad. This one is like, a, you know, you can read a book on this one. So, way, this is good stuff. This is science progressing. This is technology progressing. <laughs> All the gizmos thrown in your face for commercial purposes. This is not the real science. I'm the real science is the conceptual leap that we require to understand the nature of reality. What is going on? What is this all about? And the reason why I feel very thrilled by this is this. This Hindu religion that I come from is defined 
The word religion means realigning humanity with God. So it already accepts the, 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 the theos. The Hindu tradition is quite, not Hindu, the Indic tradition, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, use a common term called Dharma. And the term Dharma doesn't talk about God. There is no mention of God. It says making sense of the human condition. What is the nature of reality? What is this all about? What are the <coughs> rules and the laws that dictate the world that we live in? What are the rules that dictate the external world as well as the rules that dictate the inner man? You know, this in linguistic faculty we possess, the intellect that we possess, where does it spring from? What is its foundation? What is its scope? What is limitation? We want to understand all this, the external laws as the laws internal, and harness them for our betterment. This is called dharma. <coughs> so you see, the Hindus are stuck with science. We can never ever, this you can tell any Hindu you meet, you can never ever disagree with the findings of science. You can challenge some of his conclusions. But you can never disagree with the findings of science. And Hindus have always been like that. They are always ready for the challenge. And they were prepared to, look, if you show me any part of Hinduism that does not agree with the findings of science, I will discard it like this, without hesitation. I am allowed to do that. But that's how it's defined. It must continue to play ball with science. Not some of the conclusions the scientists want to <coughs> shove down our, down our throat, <coughs> but its findings. So, for example, the Hindus have not, or the Indic religions, the four Indians have no problem with evolution. We have no problem with evolution whatsoever. We say we have come out of the animal kingdom, so we have no problem with Darwin. But we've got a problem with Dawkins. Because he extends this further and says we have come out of the material kingdom. He said, no, no, we part company here. There's no proof of that. There's something very different about living things which cannot be an extension of the material kingdom. So this is where we part. But you see, we have no problem with Darwin and evolution. We don't believe in theory of creation, we believe in theory of evolution. <coughs> Let me just touch on this idea of the Big Bang Theory and you might be very interested in what is going on. Recently there was a Horizon program, I think uh, you know, um, Roger Pandros was also interviewed regarding the Big Bang Theory and you see this is what we're discovering. Science, pure science, seems to be struggling Instead of becoming convergent as it used to, it is becoming divergent. And as you are going to find out in, the, you know, in your physics classes, what appear to be a very focused enterprise, kind of taking us closer and closer to the, if you like, the end product, the four forces and the four part, or the, or the, the elementary particle, the, the, the kind of basic elementary particle and the standard model, things seem to have been converging. And suddenly the whole thing has diverged in a dramatic manner in the last 50 years. To what extent has it diverged? Surely you know by now. Now, you see, you have to fumble about in 11 dimension space-time. And of course, you get lost in that. Because when you have 11 dimension space-time, there are infinite variations available for you. Infinite variations. So there are infinite theories which can operate in 11 dimension space-time because you opened up the doorway. So anything is possible there. So if you go into 11 dimension space-time in order for you to reconcile gravitation with quantum, I don't think that's an elegant theory. If you go to 12 dimension, you can get Harry Potter. <laughs> you see, this is my question. This is my issue. Science, it's not prepared to accept. But it's at the moment, the theoretical sciences are struggling. The zoo particle is growing and it seems to be completely out of hand. You've got gluons and you've got this and that and you've got no end of... I mean, if you don't get a headache, I don't know what else will give you a headache. I've got paracetamol, by the way. But this is what's happening. Look, I'm making light of a serious issue. There is divergence. That's why, you know, when I, when I looked at this Horizon program, which is just recorded recently, there were about half a dozen different scientists giving different version about the Big Bang Theory. They can't agree on anything now. As many scientists, that many visions of world, uh, visions of, of, of uh, world views. So you see, there's a divergence state. This is seriously worrying. And it is necessary to bring about a convergence in science too. And why does this happen? Like, why are we struggling? Let me tell you why we are struggling. Which is the, what is the ploy in science that too need to be jettisoned? And I've done a big article on this. And I go into the lion's den. This article saying, really meaning, challenging the paradigm of materialism is matter is underpinning to this reality. Matter is the primary building block of everything we see, including ourselves. Is if you like a paradigm in which science has been operating very successfully for the last 2,000 years. And I wrote an article 
with the New Humanist magazine, an atheistic magazine, happily publish, saying, Jason, very interesting article, we want to publish it. What am I saying and what, what is going on? You see, let me just tell you how, just as we produce an exaggerated human being to try and discover spirituality in the name of religion, in the name of science, this is what we have done. We have done it meaning, it's a well-meaning enterprise, but you see what's happened. Since ancient times, when human beings were trying to come to terms with the world they were living in, they would say, ah, this is wood, this bonds, this is water, it flows. So they looked at various, if you like, material aspect to their being, or the world they were experiencing, and discovered that there is substance, and the substance has got certain attributes. This is how we started classifying the world. This is how all the sciences started. So you had this idea of, you know, fire, water, you know, ether and all that. So this idea of substance and attributes is the way we started making sense of the world that we live in. Science continued to progress by extrapolating, just as we extrapolated this superhuman, exaggerated human being, in science we did the same, except we, rather than, ex you know, have an infinite, we went into the infinitesimal. We went the wrong way. Saying that even if you go to smaller and smaller bits of matter, you will have really the whole of this world can be explained in terms of little tiny pieces of matter with certain attributes. So what are these attributes? Of course you all know it. It's called mass, charge, spin. Oh, we are so clever. See what we've done? The same thing we're seeing in the physical world, we've done in the smaller world. Saying even the smallest of the small is nothing but a lump of matter, substance with attributes. If you've got quarks, oh, it's got this much spin and this and this strange number. So you put certain attributes. And by doing that, you can explain the world. It seems to be working extremely well. It worked extremely well till when? Till the 1920s and the discovery of quantum. You see, the reason why most physicists will run away when you ask them to explain the quantum phenomena to them conceptually, not mathematically. You see, they are very good. They'll be just phobia with mathematics. And you see, this is a Schrodinger equation. And this is the potential well. And this is how the thing particle kind of behaves. And this is the standing way. We say, wow, how so clever. You just give us a mathematical formalism. I'm asking for a conceptual grasp of this particular phenomena. Ask them. Richard Feynman used to ask every university professor, come on guys, what is quantum? What is it? Nobody would put his hand up because he, you know, he knows he has no clue. <coughs> so conceptually, suddenly, we lost touch with reality and we are just living, if you like, on pure mathematical formalism, which is extremely successful. To the ninth decimal point it works. Whether it's your quantum, you know, your, your computer chip or your DNA, it works extremely well. Well tested, you know, but it's the most well tested theory in physics. But the quantum phenomenon is, in fact, the central feature of physics. Look, first of all, let me, I think, let us praise each other here. Out of all the sciences, the most pretentious of all sciences, the most arrogant, you know, is which one? Is your science, physics. It tells biologists, chemists, engineers, come and sit at my feet and crack coconuts. <laughs> I'll answer all your questions. When it comes to the nitty-gritty, I'm the, I the daddy, come here. See, the most pretentious. And in physics, the most, if you like, the central phenomena which has really puzzled the physicist for the last century now, 90 years I would say, is quantum. I think it is far more successful and stupendous, this is the language they use, stupendously successful than all other phenomena that we discovered so far. Gravitation, electromagnetism, elementary particles, nuclear, but these are peanuts compared to the quantum phenomena. Because all of them have to run around quantum. This is the central. And this is not a periphery, periphery issue. And it puzzles them. Now how do scientists get around these puzzles? These are the two tricks they use. You have to check them out, you'll find them. One, they will say, well, we have explained so many things in the past which were almost impossible, and we will do the same with quantum. In days to come, we'll show you it's just a material phenomena, some hidden variables of matter, kind of, ah, ha, ha, we will sort you out. Einstein tried to do it until he died. You see, this is one way, this is called, in John Polkingon's language, drawing blank checks on the future. That's, you know, your students, you know, your parents will be very annoyed if you start doing that. And in science, they do it happily. So if you talk to, you know, Murray Gell-Mann, he'll say, yeah, they'll sort it out in days to come, don't bother us now. You've not sorted out nearly 80 years now. So it sits there right at the heart of, right in the middle of physics saying, explain me, what am I, who am I, what's going on here? 
This is one ploy they use, drawing blank checks on the future. You see, you need to challenge scientists too. Sometimes they forget, the, if you like, the limitation, or the, if you like, the, they know the scope of the enterprise, but they forget the limitations, and just kind of exaggerate, get, get carried away themselves, become arrogant too. The second way they phobia off is this. This is, again, a lovely way of doing things. They throw a jungle of jargon in your face and circumvent the problem. This is another thing. You'll find some books which will give you a headache because they'll throw such huge amount of jungle of jargon that they've created themselves for their own benefit. And it appears all very clever. It appears very clever looking. I mean, Daniel Dennett is the best example. If you look at Daniel Dennett's work on, say, consciousness, he writes books and books on it. And what does he do, really? He said, hmm, see, consciousness, I'll explain it away. I mean, the people are in, in the field of consciousness, like Su Susan Greenfield said, this is the most mind-blowing stuff that you discover in, in neuroscience. But does Daniel Dennett agree? No, he said, I'll explain it away, Susan, no problem. So what does he do? He says, just nothing, but then he uses a much more elaborate, I, I'm not going to memorize his, 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 his jungle of jargon. He said, basically, it's really just using computer lingo. He says, it's really, if you like, a mismatch between the software and the hardware of your brain. This is consciousness? Yes. Very, in very clever language. He writes books and books on it. <coughs> and people bow down. Oh, yes, he's explained consciousness away. You've explained nothing away. Just thrown, you know, jungle of jargon in my face and you got lost in it and you want me to get lost in it as well. Rather than answer, take it head on. This is the second flow we use. Just a jungle of jargon to fob you off. This is the arrogance of science sometimes. These are the two things that appear. So first of all, let me go back to the quantum issue. What is actually going on and why is it creating such a, such a puzzle conceptually? Mathematically, it's perfect. Straight away, the quantum phenomena, the reason why they are struggling is this. First, they say, quantum is reality, the world that you see of matter is an appearance. They are telling you that, this is Heisenberg. Matter is, is a paradox, quantum is reality. So the question arises, how does this mathematical reality turn into material reality? This is called the wave collapse problem. And they say, I don't know. And then, second question, who does it? Who has got the power of turning this mathematical reality into material reality? Does they, like, like Stephen Hawking said, well, does they, if a frog looks at the moon, does the moon come into being? Yeah, ha, ha, he thinks it's funny. Yeah, this is the problem, observer problem. So you've got the observer problem, and this main problem, like how does this mathematical reality become material? Because it's in contradiction. And they say, we don't know, we don't know. Oh dear, oh dear. And this is your central of physical, of physical sciences? Oh yes. But you don't know what's going on. That's why you have this Schrodinger's cat and these weird issues. Because you see, the, this is a, something so dramatically different from normal understanding of physical world that it defies any simplistic explanation. And you know why they are struggling? Fixation on matter, fixation on substance and its attributes. They want to continue, just as the person of religion wants to continue to have, hang on to his God. If he God goes, he goes. He's very keen, make, hang on to his God's saying, God, you can't go, I'm going to hang on to your feet. Same way, the, the physicists, the scientists are very much fixated on the idea of substance, lump of matter, and explain everything in terms of this matter and its attributes, can't let go. Because they are fixated on matter and gives it primary position, they are not able to answer these very difficult issues about what is the quantum reality, what is actually all this. They are not prepared to take it head on because they don't want to let go. Look. <coughs> just lightening up a little bit. The quantum phenomena had three fathers. Now, if you have any child who's got three fathers, you can expect what kind of a child it will be. A weird one. <laughs> now, the child this quantum had, that the fathers this quantum child had are, of course, you know, of course, Werner Heisenberg, Niels Bohr, and Schrodinger. Reluctant father. <laughs> but all of them fathers. And then this quantum chap also had an uncle who helped during his birth, but then, like a soap opera, turned villainous and tried to run him down at every opportunity. And do you know what's the name of this villainous uncle who hated the quantum thing and wanted to kill it, destroy it, waiting around every corner? Uncle Einstein. He gave birth to this phenomena. He's the one who did this with the photoelectric effect. Wow, he discovered something grand here. The reason why I'm making light is this. This phenomena has been a central issue 
puzzling them, that if you like, the, the, the sharpest brain in physics. It has not gone away, despite what you might hear. It has not gone away. It sits in the middle and says, sort me out, who am I? And because you want to explain him in terms of matter, you can't do it. Now let me give you the Hindu version of what is actually happening. You don't have to agree with it. Just think about it and see if you like it. If you ask a physicist, the mathematical formalism you use, of course, you know, all those famous psi function, Schrodinger's equation, or matrix mechanics, or transformation, theory, you've got variation you can use, and they're all the same phenomena, you know, different variation. Let's like pluralism. <coughs> plural, pluralism. So you ask, what is this psi function? We said, look, it's got imaginary number, and got this E function, God help us. Oh, what is it? What is it physically? He said, look, the only thing I can tell you about the psi function, the only physical interpretation of the psi function is that if I square it, it gives you probability of existence. That's all it describes. Just probability of existence. You know the word that kind of, kind of thrills me? Existence. Existence. I mentioned this word when you are talking about esoteric Hinduism. But the underpinning of this reality is existence. Existence on its own can never be experienced because it's homogeneous. Let me give a metaphor. I use metaphors very carefully <coughs> because when you stretch any metaphor, it collapses. I'm fully aware. But see if it, this metaphor grabs your attention and gives you a deeper insight into what is a quantum phenomena. Metaphor, watch it. So if you write your thesis on it, you'll be torn to pieces, so watch it. Suppose you had a block of transparent jelly, big block of transparent jelly. It's transparent. You look into it, you see right through it. It is transparent, you can't see anything, it just, it's just invisible, so you just see through it. If you give a thumb on the side of the jelly, you see waves being set into motion on the surface of the jelly. And the waves will be interacting with other waves, and there'll be interference, and there'll be patterns and patterns within patterns. And suddenly what was invisible becomes highly visible. You say, wait, where did this come from? See what's happened. That thing on its own, it will stay invisible. You can never grasp it. <coughs> if there is a variation in it, that is visible. This is what coming out of Hinduism, esoteric Hinduism. It is saying the substratum to this world is not matter, <coughs> it is existence. Existence on its own can never be experienced, but a variation in existence can be, very, can, be, can be experienced, can become experiential. Just like those waves coming from nowhere and yet visible. So it is really existence that is wiggling about that creates the world, not little lumps of matter. I think it was in Heisenberg's words, he said, if you ever thought you can explain this universe in terms of sticks and stones or smaller versions of sticks and stones hanging on to matter, you'll be disappointed, my friend, because this phenomena is non-material. That's the only problem with quantum. It is non-material. What is it? The Hindus say, we know, we've been telling you, the underpinning to this reality is nothing but, if you like, shudder in existence. It is existence that's shuddering that creates all this world that you see. All this diversity you see in front of you, including your mental diversity, the, the mind that you possess in which to make sense of the world, all that is nothing but, if you like, these waves within waves. And that's how, you see, <coughs> that's how this reality comes into being. This is esoteric Hinduism, no God anywhere. Existence shuddering, creating this diversity we see in front of us. And it is non-material. Matter is a secondary phenomena, not the primary phenomena. Once you let go of matter, and start recognizing this deeper aspect, then quantum phenomena becomes accessible, conceptually accessible. I just touched on one, I touched on another aspect. You see to what extent you like it. I've been interacting with many people in the field of neuroscience, though it is not my field, but I like to interact because I find it very exciting and very thrilling. Just as in physics, the central problem or the hard problem of physics is quantum phenomena, in neuroscience, the hard, pheno hard problem of neuroscience, you check it out with, say, all the series of talks by Susan Greenfield. And she is perhaps one of the best, uh, best neuroscientists in the country. 
she told me because we met once and I said Susan what is this consciousness what is it? what is this? what is the, what is this all about she said I've been challenging the neuroscientists the brain the brain surgeons and the philosophers the theologians tell me what is this consciousness and which brain slice of the brain produces it tell me I will do an experiment with some poor chap and sort out where it comes from this consciousness thing what is it <coughs> every attempt to pin it down fails today it is considered to be the hard problem of neuroscience. It sits there at the heart. Just as quantum sits in physics, consciousness sits in neuroscience, in life science, saying, explain me, who am I, what am I? And it sits and puzzles the neuroscientist. <coughs> remember, I told you to remember those two words. Asti, bhati. Asti means existence. Bhati means consciousness. This is underpinning to reality and your underpinning. And this is the spiritual dimension becoming revealed. So when I talk to some neuroscientists who are strongly materially oriented, they say, Jay, go away. Consciousness is nothing but brain phenomena. It is just the electrons, the electrical and the chemical activities of your neurons that produces this fuzz or buzz that you call consciousness. There's nothing more to it. Come on, Jay, grow up. Live with it. There's nothing more to it. All this airy, fairy spirit, the only spirit we believe in comes in bottles during Christmas. It is all go away. Even they are very dedicatory to, toward the word spirit because they hate it. Why do you have only spirit? In fact, the moment the word consciousness appeared in quantum too because they said the way we can explain this quantum phenomena is that it requires a conscious ob observer to make this mathematical reality into material reality. So consciousness appeared and immediately everybody jumped up saying we can't have consciousness appear in physics. How dare it? Do you know how they can avoid a consciousness in quantum mechanics? The theory that you heard of, you know, multi-universe. Now listen, if you are prepared to go down this line, you go down any line. It is saying that while I am talking to you, infinite copies of ourselves, at every infinitesimal second means every quantum event took place. Sorry about that. <coughs> infinite copies of ourselves have been already moving away from each other. Infinite copies of ourselves. So I don't know whether you should be pleased or displeased about it because, you know, the, your bits have been going all over the place now. This, according to me, is perhaps the most divergent model you can create. You see, the most divergent model you can create, and this is divergence with a vengeance. Infinite copies of ourselves are moving away at every infinitesimal second of time while I'm talking to you. If you're prepared to go along with that, I think, you know, Occam, you know, you've heard of Occam's razor. You require a most economical worldview. This is the most uneconomical worldview that you can get. I'm going to switch this off. Because, it's like, ah, because I, I'm going to go off in the wrong world now. <laughs> Look, I'm going to shout at you. Please bear with me. Because I think it's such an interesting topic. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah. yeah. You see this idea that... Look, you can see to what ludicrous extent science is prepared to go to avoid the word consciousness appearing. The only other way they can do is say, we accept there's some <coughs> known material that is flipping the mental world, if you like, the, the mathematical world into a material world. But you require this thing which is known material. And they say, okay, we use the word conscious. Well, we don't want the word conscious to appear. It's all matter. So in order to avoid a conscious observer, if you, like this idea of consciousness appearing in physics, the only way you can avoid it is to, to agree with this Everts idea of infinite worlds, you know, kind of, you know, breaking apart all the time, every instant of a time. And if you agree with that, you might as well agree with anything. I was talking about this 11 dimension space time where you cannot get lost. This is worse. And you are, you are prepared to go down that, down that line simply because you don't want this kind of, kind of more esoteric ideas to appear in your physical, you know, kind of expression or, or, or view of the world. <coughs> And this is, to, this is the extent to which science is prepared to go to avoid losing his material grasp. This is why Einstein had a great problem with quantum. Because he was, you see, look, same with my professor in a way. Roger Prendros, you know, has been writing a lot of stuff about consciousness and quantum. And the thing that I find quite interesting is this. He's still trying, he's still, you know, fixated on matter. He's trying to produce consciousness in the microtubule, that means the skeleton of your neuron cell. This is where his consciousness comes into being. He is still stuck on matter. He doesn't realize that this consciousness can be something independent of matter. And not something that, you know, you squeeze the neuron, and consciousness comes, ah, it doesn't come out like that. This is, this is what he's trying to do, I'm saying indirectly. But let me just touch on this consciousness and give you another metaphor. See to what extent you like it. I'm sure you will like it. 
So when one neuroscientist says, yeah, this thing is just a brain phenomenon, and look, come on, grow up, I can easily put an you know, anesthetic in your arm, and you'll go, ah, ah, gaga, and your consciousness will be gone. You see what I've done? Interfered with the chemical activity, and I can send you off, and your consciousness is gone. It's a brain phenomena, live with it, Jay, there's nothing more. I said, look, I'll give you a metaphor, see if you like it. I gave this to Susan Greenfield as well. She liked it. So I'm, I'm on safe ground. I suppose a child walked into this room, and he discovered a dimmer switch. He started playing with the dimmer switch. He went one way, and the light came on. Went the other way, the light went off. The child will immediately come to a conclusion. You can't blame him to a conclusion the switch is producing that. You can't blame him. And yet we, the grown-ups, no, 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 no. That particular switch is just a conduit of light, in if you like, electricity. It does not produce electricity. We know it. He doesn't know it. So if you went with a hammer and, and you know, broke the switch, the light will go off. It doesn't mean you demolished electricity. You just stop the flow of electricity. So if this guy comes and hits me with a hammer on my head and says, your consciousness <coughs> is gone, he just disturbed the switch. He's blown the switch through which consciousness is percolating. He just damaged that. He has not touched consciousness because it's not a brain phenomena. It uses the brain, if you like, to percolate and make <coughs> itself visible to us. Again, this idea, this is our, if you like, the spiritual dimension to our being, consciousness, existence. This is the underpinning to this reality. It is nothing but, if you like, this, 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 this underpinning that becomes, if you like, revealed in this multifarious manner, in this diverse manner. The unity behind the diversity, this is what I'm suggesting, is not matter, despite what the material scientists will tell us. The underpinning to this reality is essentially the spirit, and it becomes manifest in this way. And look, I am very confident. I continue to make this presentation at various levels. As I said in the New Humanist magazine, I've made this very severe presentation saying, challenging the paradigm of matter. Just as time <coughs> for God is gone now, time for matter is gone as well. When you challenge both these paradigms or these ploys used by science and religion, and put them on the back burner saying it's a ploy, recognize it's a ploy. Look, if I tell you matter is a ploy, it's a myth. You say, well, we still do our electron and proton and we do this zigzag and this electron whizzing around in the shells. It works. As a ploy, it works. Carry on. Just as the gold works as a ploy. So matter in your crystallography all works. And yet we know this is a ploy. So if you can deal with matter as a ploy and, and, and if you like transcend it and look at a deeper level to this reality, then, then you see you find a reconciliation between a religious and a spiritual worldview. And I tell you what.